so let me introduce the um, speakers. Um, we have with us today uh, three of the signatories to the Yogi Carter Principles. Uh, Mara Cabral is the Executive Director of Global Action for Trans Equality. Monica Tabengua is the Executive Director of ILGA Pan-Africa. And Esther Kizmodi is a international human rights lawyer in Geneva, Switzerland, and uh, is a specialist in sexuality and reproductive rights. And my name is Andrew Park. I'm with the Williams Institute, and I work uh, on the international projects. So um, uh, let me, uh, whoops, we've gone. So let me um, just to say a few words about the Yogi Karta Principles process. The original Yogi Karta Principles is a 35-page document about human rights as they relate to the areas of sexual orientation and gender identity. And they were published as the outcome of an international meeting of human rights experts that took place in Yogi Karta, Indonesia in November of 2006. And uh, one way to follow along with this webinar might be to go to the website yogicartaprinciples.org and there you can open up a copy of the Yogi Carta Principles update plus 10 and follow along with the document. If you don't do that, you can just stick with the PowerPoint and you'll be fine. Um, but uh, it's good to know where that website is. Now the Yogi Carta Principles, they affirm binding legal standards to which all states must comply. And let me go into this in a little bit of detail because there's always questions about this. Um, people ask, are they binding? How can they be enforced? The principles themselves are not a binding document. They were not entered into by governments and they have not been ratified. What they are is a set of principles that are backed up by international human rights experts, um, many of whom have been identified as human rights experts by the UN because they have been either appointed as special rapporteurs or possibly to a treaty body that implements one of the main human rights treaties. So uh, the way that they represent binding international principles is that these experts looked at current international human rights law as it now stands and looked at the outcome of the treaty bodies and courts to try to say how do these um, uh, binding norms apply to SOGI uh, and now SOGI-esque. So though they re-articulate binding principles, they are not themselves binding. Nevertheless, uh, they've been cited at the Human Rights Council hundreds of times, and they've been cited in bills, legislation, executive policies, and court decisions in uh, basically I have a list of about 20 countries in front of me that I'm not going to read, but um, they've gotten a lot of traction because they're an easy way for governments to understand how human rights applies to SOGI. Uh, the original principles dealt with, uh, you know, the standard kind of set of rights that we all think of from freedom from torture, the right to found a family, right to a fair trial, uh, economic rights, political rights, uh, the whole gamut. <clears throat> and the principles don't refer to LGBT people, rather they refer to rights in accordance with one's sexual orientation and gender identity. Um, this is because human rights are universal. All people have them and they exist in all places at all times for all governments. Thus, it would be inappropriate to say that these are rights that just belong to LGBT people because they're actually rights that belong to everybody. But since governments often violate people's rights based on uh, sexual orientation and gender identity, um, then it's important to know how rights apply to that characteristic uh, that all people have, since all people have a sexual orientation and a gender identity. So then we come to the Yoga Carta Principle Update process, the plus 10 process. And this process basically looked at the developments in the past 10 years, both the developments in uh, the evolution of international human rights norms and developments in changes in society to say, uh, now that 10 years have passed, 
what do we now need to add to the original principles to make sure that the principles are up to date uh, in accordance with uh, human rights norms right now. Um, one example, for instance, is there's a principle dealing with the Internet. And I think uh, 10, uh, or back in 2007, I don't know, uh, iPhones had just started, so um, we didn't have the Internet like we had now. Um, so the first thing I'd like to do is to turn it over to Mauro, because one of the central innovations of the principles is to move from SOGI to SOGI-esque. We added definitions and um, additional uh, identities and characteristics. So, um, Mauro, can I have you talk about definitions? Yes. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Andrew, and hello, everyone. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about um, the, the old and the new definitions because the four of them are, are related. Um, if we remember the original documents, there were two definitions there. One was a definition of sexual orientation, and the other one was a definition of gender identity. And even when the definition of sexual orientation seems to be quite simple, actually, it introduced the idea that sexual orientation talks about relationships, sexual affective relationships, with people from the same gender or other uh, genders, or more than one, one gender. In the case of the gender identity definition, it tried to combine issues that has to do specifically with gender identity, with the way in which people identify themselves, but also with some expressive issues, like the way in which people express their gender through appearance, for example. But also, it tries to include some bodily issues including, for example, the modification of bodily appearance or function by medical, surgical, or other means. Uh, this was a way of talking about gender expression and bodily issues through the principles without including a specific definition about them. It also contribu contributed to make this definition of gender uh, identity a more encompassing definition. Uh, but 10 years after the original um, meeting to produce the, the Jakarta principles, it was necessary for us to introduce two definitions, which have the different connections with the first two. One is a definition of gender expression. This definition, as you can uh, see, is expanding what we, these expressive components in the definition of gender identity, making gender expression an issue of itself. In the case of definition of sex characteristics, this definition is new to the, to the principles. It wasn't included in the definition of gender identity or in the definition of sexual orientation. And it has to do with the inclusion specifically of intersex issues in the second uh, version of the, of the principles or in, the, in, in, in this supplement of the, of the principles. But however, you can find these four definitions in the same uh, preamble. And the intention for this is to make sure that both the Yogyakarta principles and the Yogyakarta principles plus 10 are considered, uh, including these four definitions. So when you read uh, even the, the Yogyakarta principles produced in 2006, it's an invitation to read them as applying to them the definition of gender expression and the definition of set characteristics. That's all for me if you want to, to move to the next speaker. The signatories of the YP plus 10 principles decided not to touch that document. Uh, so that governments that have <coughs> begun to use that document and courts that have cited it, that still uh, is a solid relationship between the government support for that document. So the YP plus 10 principles pick up where the um, original principles left off, but the definition, definitions apply to both. Okay, so let's um, go to look at the principles themselves, and let's start with principle number 30, the first 
your card principles were 1 through 29. So, Monica, can you tell us about uh, yeah. the next principle? Yeah, thank, thank you, uh, Andrew. Um, so, I'll just, I'll just kind of start with a few basic principles about human rights in general. Um, basically, meant to protect individual freedoms or liberties uh, from infringement by governments, organizations, or groups, or private individuals. Uh, and they are meant to ensure that all persons are able to participate in civil political uh, in all spheres of life without discrimination. Now, where, do, where you find rights, mostly uh, in most countries, they are codified in, in, in constitution, national constitutions, um, especially under the Bill of Rights section. Um, you can also find them in international human rights instruments, uh, such as the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Uh, you have seen, you have many, many, many uh, treaties that have been signed so far. Um, but you have, when you have rights, uh, what we have realized is, uh, you know, sometimes they sit in print, but it's very difficult for people to access the rights. Uh, uh, there is a principle of the national law that requires states to respect, protect, fulfill, and, and promote human rights. And so, in looking at this particular right that we have uh, put down as the right to state protection, we were really trying to find ways so that people are able, you know, these rights that are codified in the different, uh, um, in the different treaties or in the constitutions, a way to elaborate so that people can be able to, to get proper protection. And that means states have, states have duties they have responsibility to respect, to protect, to fulfill, and to promote human rights. So when we have the duty to respect, basically we are talking about the state not being responsible itself to, uh, for infringement of rights, uh, whether it's based on uh, gender, race, including sexual orientation, gender identity, gender expression, and sex characteristics. So state has to take responsibility not to infringe rights itself or, or through its agents or through actions. And if, if there are such, if such derogations or such infringement occur, the state has to come up with um, plans to mitigate plans to prevent or plans to remedy the situation. So this is the responsibility of the state to ensure that there is a remediation, to ensure that there is a, you know, just prevention through enactment of laws, policies, uh, through just, you know, making sure that the rule of law is followed uh, to ensure that everybody has equal protection of the law. Um, so the, the state also, under this, the, the right to state protection, has a right, has a duty to protect. Um, and basically that means it has to make sure that uh, third parties do not infringe other people's rights. And so this is taking, again, taking appropriate steps through legislation, uh, through the police, Investigating fully where they are, they are, uh, they are infringement. Investigating fully where they are infringement through the judiciary being able to to prosecute and and providing adequate remedy. So where necessary, people being tried for criminal offences uh, and compensation, providing accountability. So that's that's a duty that is important. Um, there's another duty that is within this right to state protection, and that's the duty to fulfill. Basically, having a right and being able to access does not help anyone. And so denying, for instance, LGBTI uh, groups the right to register, that is not fulfilling uh, the, the rights that are within our constitutions or within uh, the, the international uh, human rights obligation. So that kind of Denial, where people are denied access 
to be able to, 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 to enjoy those rights. That means the state is fa failing in its duty to, to fulfill, uh, you know, its duty to protect individuals. Um, the other duty that is encapsulated under the right to state protection is the duty to promote. Basically, we are talking about the uh, fact that the state has a responsibility to ensure that there is data through research, through uh, collecting statistics to ensure that people are aware of what is happening. Um, we know today that there are a lot of um, human rights violations that are occurring in the different uh, jurisdictions. The state has a responsibility to collect that data, that information, and, and send it out and disseminate it so that, that you, know, you are able to, to tell how much is happening and how protection there is. Uh, it also to, to assist the state itself planning for the protection and for prevention purposes. I think prevention is very important and to, the way to that is, is to ensure that people know their rights, uh, to ensure that there is information out there and that information is correct, um, and that people are able to access it uh, without discrimination. Capacity building and web building play a very important part in ensuring helping the state to fulfill their obligation to protect. So this, this was a really a quick summary of the rights and there are many things that uh, many actions that the state can take in order to prevent uh, you know the, the, the violation of rights uh, by, 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 by individuals, by groups, by corporations, um, and by itself, there has to be accountability. Um, I, I'll stop here. Um, thank you very much, Monica. Uh, and if I could ask the presenters all to remember to press star seven to unmute, but press star six to mute because we're getting some squeak sounds in the background. Um, uh, then, um, Mauro, could you talk to us about principle number 31? Yeah, thank you very much. Can you see me well? Uh, yes, I think a little louder would help. Okay, thank you. Uh, I have to confess that this is one of my favorite principles. If we are allowed to have favorites. Um, and it's a principle that I hope that this will have uh, a huge impact both on the international and regional human rights systems, but also in changing policies uh, on the ground. And as you can see in the presentation of the principle, it combines uh, different issues. And I would like to invite you just uh, to touch the first sentence, you know, so, you know stopping in recognition. So like everyone has the right to legal recognition. Where we can read that, for example, in the principle three, in the, in the original Jakarta principles. But then, the principle introduces without, without reference to requiring assignment of exclusion of sex, gender, sexual orientation, gender identity, gender expression, or sex characteristics. And here, in this, in this paragraph, we see the strength of the definition, for example, of sex characteristics, thinking of sex characteristics as being these physical features, just as in Italia, for example, that people usually believe that are necessary uh, to achieve legal recognition. So this principally what it's saying is questioning the legitimacy of requiring any information, including information about sex, gender, and sex characteristics, in order for people to have the right to legal recognition. But also it says that everyone has the right, sorry, uh, to obtain identity documents, which is going beyond the just legal recognition, including birth certificates. And again, but it is saying that it's not necessary to know the sex characteristics of a person in order for that person to get access to identity documents, including birth certificates or, or national identity cards. And we have to see that in most countries of the world, it is necessary to get access to that information, uh, the statements to have access, in order for people to get access to these uh, identity documents. And in the third paragraph, it says that everyone has the right to check change the gender information in such documents. So, so we can see in this three paragraphs 
everything that these principles is changing in the way in which we conceive the relationship between uh, uh, legal personhood and uh, legal documents and revealing information about our sex and gender, including our sex characteristics. So if we move to the next slide, um, we can see here, uh, again, the next one. Um, okay, so you can see here the different state recommendations. And if we go to A, we can see that uh, the principle established only should require personal information that is relevant, reasonable, and necessary as required law. Then uh, it, it calls to put an end to the registration of the sex and gender of the person in identity documents, such as their certificates, identity cards, and, and so forth. So what it's saying basically is that uh, assigning sex or gender in identity documents in official documents, a practice that needs to end. But anyway, considering that uh, this is a practice that still uh, continues, it requires that those places, sex and gender, are assigned. You need to have a quick, transparent, and accessible mechanism to change the name and and and, and sex markers. And that this. Uh, necessary to provide all mechanisms to make a change effective. But there's something uh, more here, and if you go to number two under C, you can say that it says like make available a multiplicity of gender marker options. And we introduced here because even principle three in the original to Jakarta principles under point B says that every person has a right to be recognized in the self-defined gender identity, um, there was a con conservative interpretation of that, uh, co considering that this gender self-defined gender identity are uh, too much men. In this case, we are making very clear that the that states, in order to be compatible with human rights standards, needs to make available a multiplicity of gender market options, which means that it it must go beyond binary gender markers. If we move to 3 or C, we can say that the principle calls specifically for, among other issues, the depatologization of access to recognition. So that medical or ecological intervention, including a diagnosis, uh, shouldn't be considered among the eligibility uh, criteria for my, for, for my needs. And it also removes the minimum of maximum of age, which is really improving or hoping to improve uh, children's and adolescents' access to legal information. And Mara, why don't you continue with number 32? Yeah. Excuse me, can I say something in connection to principle 31? Yes, go ahead, Esther. Hi, good day for, for everyone. I just wanted to emphasize in connection to this principle that um, it's about legal recognition. So it's really important the emphasis is on that laws should provide guarantees. But there is misconception very often that it has to be a separate legal gender recognition law that has to be passed by the parliament separately. And it's really important to recognize that different uh, countries have different legal settings and laws and policy and environment that can provide various options for legal gender recognition. It's possible that uh, a new law doesn't need to be adopted in order to get human rights-based legal gender recognition but an enabling constitutional framework, non-discrimination law, or gender equality law can provide the framework. It's also possible that the environment, the legal environment, is neutral enough and human rights based enough that only a policy might be needed, so not a parliamentary process for legal gender recognition. So it's really important to see the actual national legal context to, be, uh, to decide uh, whether and what legal measures are needed for the recognition and enforcement of this principle and right. 
Um, thank you very much, um, Esther. And um, participants, continue to type questions in the little window if, if, you, if they pop into your mind. Um, Mauro, uh, Principal 32. Yeah. So, Principal 32, the right to one day and mental identity. If you read the presentation of the principal, you can see that it combines references to uh, Principal 10. Uh, on torture in the regional uh, Jakarta principles, but also to principle 18 uh, on protection against medical uh, medical abuse. And there are different reasons why it was necessary to have a specific principle. And I would say that it is strongly connected with the history of the human rights system and of different civil society activism during the past 10 years, uh, where human rights violations, and particularly human rights uh, violations against uh, intersex um, children, children uh, were starting to be not only increasingly visible, but increasingly addressed from a particular framework, which is the framework of torture. Uh, if we move to the next slide, we can see um, that this principle affirms uh, not only uh, the right of uh, every person to bodily and mental integrity, autonomy, and self-determination, but they have a key emphasis on the right of children, uh, where it has to do with the framework of the right of the child, of course, but also so with expanding uh, the paragraph on uh, intersex issues under the original Jakarta principles, under principle uh, 18, from protection against um, medical, medical abuses. Because in this case, we are seeing that the text is addressing specifically the modifications to sex characteristics, um, making a special emphasis on the need of a child to be consulted and to provide informed consent every time that a modification of the sex characteristics is uh, is recommended. But at the same time, um, this principle has another sp specific emphasis in what it needs to be considered the best interest of the child. One of the challenges of the paragraph on modification, bodily modifications under principle 18 in the, in the original Jakarta principle was the possibility of identify modifications with the best interests of the child. In the case of Principle 32, that you can uh, see if you go to the uh, website that Andrew recommended, we have, for example, in point E, the need for states to ensure that the concept of the best interest of the child is not manipulated to justify practices that conflict with the child's right to bodily integrity. In this case, this principle is assuming a critical perspective not only in terms of consent, but also in what is to be considered culturally and legally the best interest of the child. At the same time, this principle has two very important, other two very important points. One, that it calls states to provide adequate reparations to victims of body and mentally, the violations of bodily and mental integrity, economic and self-determination. But the other thing, is that it advanced in order to prohibit the use of anal and genital examination in legal and administrative procedures and criminal prosecution, uh, which is key in order to address human rights violations going on in different parts of the world exactly at this, this very time. Um, thank you, Mauro. And so, um, Monica, uh, tell us about Principle 33. Uh, it's star seven to unmute, by the way. Um, am I back on yet? Yep, here you are. Okay, cool. <laughs> so, um, yes, this right, basically, it, it, it's looking at the fact that uh, many of the countries that we live in today, they criminalize different aspects of our lives based on uh, uh, sexual orientation, actual or perceived, 
gender identity, gender expression, uh, and sex characteristics. And we found we find these laws a lot in penal codes uh, or in, in the constitution. But sometimes you uh, you know there are countries where which have customary laws, religious laws, and you find such criminalization in 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 in, in this customary laws or, or indigenous laws. Um, they may be very explicit or they may be couched in very ambiguous terms, uh, like what we have in some uh, in, in colonies of, of, of Britain, you find uh, offenses that are against the order of nature, uh, which are very, very vague, but they are applied to sanction specifically, uh, you know, uh, people who are gay, bisexual, transgender, etc. So these are the laws that we, we feel we felt it was necessary that we say that people should be have a right to be free from criminalization and sanction um, arising directly or indirectly from a person's actual perceived sexual orientation, gender identity, gender expression, gender characteristics. But these are not the total of all uh, criminalization. Uh, people are sometimes targeted through other subsidiary laws or practices, uh, such as sex work, for instance, uh, or adultery, nuisance, uh, loitering, begging. And these are used indirectly, again, to, to, to criminalize people based on SOGS. Uh, and so we are basically targeting those. This, this, this Principle 33 targets those indirect ways that uh, states or societies use to penalize people uh, or to, to criminalize people based on um, their sexual orientation, gender identity, gender expression, and sex characteristics. And basically, what we are saying is that all of these should be removed, they should be repealed. And we also recognize that there are countries that have been actually sanctioning or rather uh, enforcing these laws. And there are people that might already be um, in, in, in detention uh, for, these, for, 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 for various reasons, as I have already enumerated. And so we are also thinking that this right to be free from criminalization and sanction should apply to them. And that basically means that they should, uh, as the countries are considering decriminalization, they should be allowed out, they should be released, um, they should, and their convictions expunged, and they should not have criminal records for past offenses that really are necessary. Um, as well as recognizing this, uh, that it continues, what we, we realize is that um, the state police and judiciary, the, the, the judicial system needs to be trained in order to understand uh, that equality before the law is important, and that means non-discrimination on every basis. And so we are talking about ensuring that law enforcement officers and other agents that are responsible for the enforcement of laws should be held accountable. Uh, for any violence, for any negligence, uh, for any abuse based on the criminalization, right? So we are talking about in some countries where police go up about um, picking up, uh, um, raiding or, and picking up sex workers and or possibly raping or, or using violence against, they should be held accountable. That there should be investigations and the, the judiciary should understand that it is their duty to ensure that this happens. Um, the, the other thing is the training of the judiciary is, is also important because um, a lot of people are targeted to trump up charges. And this is important in many jurisdictions where arrest happens. Uh, you are picked up on the street, and, and by the time you get to, to court, you are, you are, your charges have been trumped to trump up something else. And so the judiciary should be aware. So we, we, this principle is basically 
saying that the judiciary should be trained in order to be able to recognize that these, these are ways for targeting people based on sexual orientation, gender identity, gender expression, and sex characteristics. So basically that all criminalization based on SOGS, including body mo modification procedures and treatments should not happen unless they are free, uh, they are, you know, based informed consent. And so this is basically what uh, uh, this, 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 this principle is recommending, that all forms of criminalization and sanction impacting on rights and freedom on the basis of so the ask should be oh, removed. No, go ahead. Sorry. Uh, okay. Um, thanks, Monica. Um, and can we uh, hear about principle number 34 from Esther? Yes. Can you hear? Yes. Yes. So the right to promote protection from poverty is uh, an acknowledgement of the consequences of historic and systemic, systemic discrimination on the grounds of sexual orientation, gender identity expression, and sex characteristic and, and bodily diversity. That is resulting in poverty and social uh, exclusion. Uh, poverty most com commonly associated and defined through economic deprivation and lack of income. However, this principle in the context of uh, the Jogjakarta principles call the attention how the systemic discrimination on the grounds of the relevant grounds, the, the relevant issues, leads to the violation of social and cultural rights such as rights related to education, work, uh, access to health, housing, but also to civil and political rights like the right to life, the right to security, or access to justice. So how poverty and discrimination and the right to non-discrimination is connected to almost all other rights. When it comes to state obligations, the state obligations are highlighting uh, prevention measures that how prevention of the consequences of structural violence should be addressed. It's also calling how to address the root causes of, uh, of poverty in relation to sexual orientation, gender identity expression, and sex characteristics. And it calls the attention to state obligation to remedies and access to justice. It, however, it has to be noted that redress needs to go beyond the individual and it needs to go to the domain of non-repetition to alleviate the systemic repetition that leads to, uh, of human rights that leads to poverty. So when we look at the specific state obligations, A and can we go Actually, to the state yeah, obligations? Sorry. Yeah, we don't we don't have a slide for the state obligations for that one. So when it goes to state obligations, uh, they talk about how to specifically make positive actions. So not only to refrain from, non, from discrimination and violence, but how to take positive actions, legislative, administrative, budgetary, and other measures to address poverty associated with or exacerbated by sexual orientation, gender identity, gender expression, or sex characteristics. For example, how to include uh, such discrimination and violation of human rights in poverty reduction strategies. It's, all, it's also calling to, for, the, for ensuring the state obligation to ensure participation and inclusion of those experiencing, experiencing poverty, because, poverty because of uh, sexual orientation, gender identity, expression, and sex characteristics and how to adopt uh, implementation measures in this regard. It calls the um, attention, the state obligation. Yes? Yeah, no, I was just, um, 
um, saying that we probably need to pick up the pace in order to be able to finish on time and have time for questions. So just on one more point on this, that why the Jogjakarta principles are focusing on state obligations. Here, it's really important to call the attention of the obligations of non-state actors, for example, the private sector, but also international actors like the World Bank, who are setting the framework for poverty reduction strategies. So their obligation uh, in regards to the principles, the Jogjakarta principles. Yes. Um, thanks, Esther. And Principle 35, Monica. Okay. But, uh, thank you again. Um, yeah, there, there's been um, a lot of discussion around uh, access to sanitation for um, people uh, because we, we've had cases where uh, transgender persons have been denied access into public toilets, uh, public sanitation facilities, uh, and therefore, basically, it is like what Esther was saying, all rights are connected. And so the state has a duty to protect. And even in sanitation, and basically that is, is a duty to provide adequate facilities for everyone without discrimination. Adequate, safe, and equitable, secure sanitation facilities for everyone. Um, but we realize that just the provision of the, the, the facilities does not, you know, provide protection. So there is need for the state to go an extra step to say that in public facilities, there has to be uh, an obligation for institutions to provide the security to ensure that everyone should not be discriminated against uh, in accessing san san sanitation on the basis of their sexual orientation, gender identity, expression, or sex characteristics. And that, in particular, in places like schools, prisons, uh, hospitals, they, they should, the, 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 the institution should ensure that there, is, there are policies that protect uh, individuals to be able to to exercise these facilities without discrimination. Uh, and also that includes what I talked about is basically to, to educate people about uh, the issues that are at hand. And so all of this information must be made available without discrimination so that in schools, uh, in, in curricula, uh, students learn that people are diverse uh, and that they have no right to, to, to deny one or the other uh, to access sanitation because of their sex characteristics, their uh, gender, gender identity expression or sexual orientation. And so, so it is a duty of the state to protect and provide, ensure that this right is, is secure for everyone without discrimination. Thank you, Monica. And now Principal 36, excuse me, Ma uh, Maro. Yep. Thank you very much. And as, as you said, when we began the uh, webinar, uh, this issue of human rights related to information and communication technologies was not particularly present or relevant when the original Jakarta principles were produced. So they are... Uh, a, a, little, a little louder, please, Baro. Oh, okay, sorry. Yep. So I was saying that these principles, as you said, were not, not uh, necessarily um, relevant when the original principles were discussed, but they are really relevant uh, right now in our time. And again, this is a principle that combines different issues. It started with, if you see the first paragraph, with rights to protection. The, the, the same right to uh, protection, sorry, the same protection of rights online as, as uh, offline. But it has to do with something, really, so with something very relevant for our communities that has to do, for example, with hate speech in social media. But it has to do also, if you see, if you go to the second sentence, to the right to access and to use information. It has to do not only with getting access to internet, but also with our ability to get access to information 
and to provide information, something that, for example, coming from trans and intersex communities is key for trans and intersex people in different countries to be able not only to access information posted online, but to be able to provide information without risk in violation of human rights. It also has to do with the right to privacy and for people to be uh, protected against the violation of the right to privacy when using information and communication technology um, because of, for example, concerns in, term, in terms of national uh, security. This principle is also uh, strongly connected with uh, data protection. Is it, what is to be is to say? It's not only concerned with uh, personal privacy, but also with the privacy of the information that we produce and put and put online. This principle has a key importance for uh, not only for individuals, but also for organizations and networks. Uh, working on on internet on issues of sexual orientation, gender identity, gender expressions, and sex uh, characteristics. That's all for me, Andrew. Great, thank you, Mauro. Um, and number thirty-seven, the right to the truth, Esther Kismadi. I know we have very limited time, but I just would like to uh, call the attention that the right to truth is a very innovative, important, forward-looking application of an existing international, regionally, and nationally recognized human rights, human rights that has been uh, recognized internationally, regionally, nationally in the context of several issues such as disappearances, indigenous rights, war crimes. It's, it's a right that's rarely being used, but however incredibly important, both in connection to sexual orientation, gender diversity, and sex characteristics. Um, those who are interested should also listen to the previous webinar that provides uh, very great details. It highlights that uh, justice cannot be served unless the elements of a crime, violence, discrimination uh, are revealed, preserved, and uh, uh, came to and revealed and came to light. Uh, just to understand what we are talking about, very often uh, in case of intersex uh, surgeries that are committed uh, very early ages, uh, very often at infancy. Um, under the hands of uh, the medical establishment and parents without the consent, uh, medical records are very often not available when uh, a person is reaching adulthood and should uh, be able to reach redress and justice. So on one hand, it's an individual right, uh, the right to know, the right to information, the right to access to justice and remedies, but it's also a social right that calls for non-repetition. So when you go to state obligation, it's obligations, it's very revealing that it calls uh, for protection, but also for uh, positive actions to make information available, uh, prevent, prevent further violations, but also to integrate the, the knowledge about, about violations in educational curricula, whatever it's general education or medical education or legal education, and also make um, information available and acknowledge the violations uh, through um, exhibitions, through uh, public acknowledgement uh, in museums and, and other forums. What is really important to emphasize in connection to this right and principle that the right to truth is not subject to statute of limitation and its application must by our mind is due in nature, nature as an individual right and the right of the society at large. It means that very often human rights violations happen in childhood and the person is an adult, uh, so many years are passing by the time a person or a society uh, can claim the right to truth. So the state limitation should not apply to this right. 
and emphasizing again that for even if for many this the right to truth is something that may hear first in the context of sexual orientation gender identity expression and sex characteristic it's an existing right that has been applied uh, earlier so it really encouraged to use widely this right and principle for advocacy and um, right promotion and seeking um, protection and promotion of human rights. Um, thank you very much, Esther. And I think it was worth kind of highlighting the um, innovative nature of this right. Um, how about uh, the last right, Esther? Um, whoops, principle 38. I will be very short because I know that uh, time is limited. I would like to emphasize two aspects in relation to this, uh, to this right. Uh, again, that this right can be claimed as an individual right or a group right, uh, group right that connected to uh, human dignity, bodily diversity, um, gender diversity, sexual orientation beyond the binary concept beyond uh, a uh, dominant uh, social, cultural uh, structure within uh, society and connect uh, to the very understanding that sexual orientation, gender identity and expression and sex characteristics are individual rights and depend on the individual, including uh, the individual culture and uh, the individual's own understanding of culture. I would like to um, call the uh, attention to the limitation of rights in connection to those who try to limit human rights in relation on the ground of sexual orientation, gender identity, expression, and sex characteristics in the name of culture. It is a recognized human right, including human rights, including in the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, that a right to culture cannot be evoked uh, 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 in a way that it jeopardizes the enjoyment of other people's human rights. Um, thank you, Esther. And we also included, just because the Winter Olympics are happening this week, um, a, an additional state recommendation about sporting organizations uh, and the um, kind of ongoing controversy with, from a human rights perspective about um, the uh, gender assignment and gender segregation of, of sports. So um, let me go to the questions. Um, and let me first say in response to one of the questions that we are working on the translations for French and Spanish. Um, so those are, will be issued hopefully soon. And then after that, we'll go into translations of all of the other remaining UN languages. The original Yoga Carta principles were translated in six UN languages and uh, by other groups throughout the world, probably maybe 20 some um, local languages. <clears throat> so one of the um, questions we received is, um, uh, if I can kind of interpret this question, how, given these principles, how do we deal with the fact that though some human rights bodies have articulated a right on which these principles are based, uh, other human rights bodies don't. And so um, how do we deal with that? What is the meaning of the principles when, when they're not followed? And um, are they really rights if all human rights bodies don't recognize them? Um, does any, do any of the panelists want to address that? I can go quickly uh, saying that uh, the nature of recognition of human rights is such as that uh, different human rights are recognized in different uh, instruments. Um, we have all the conventions that recognize certain rights and others not. The treaty monitor monitoring bodies themselves recognize the intersectionality of the conventions and how they need to be applied across. On the other hand, calling the attention as well that these human rights are recognized at the regional level and in national constitutions and laws. So we need to look at the body of the sources of human rights in order to see how to advance the application of various human rights in the context of a particular human uh, treaty monitoring body or regional body or national body. I hope it answers the question. Yes, and and what we did, and Esther, at the, um, Esther was one of the people at the 
um, meeting that produced the YP Plus 10 document is make sure that we did not articulate brand new rights. So for instance, you will not see a right to same-sex marriage in here because at the time of the meeting of the experts, um, there were no international human rights bodies or bodies basing a decision on international human rights law that found same-sex marriage to be a right under current standards. Um, uh, and then another question that uh, somebody wanted to ask is, um, is there a strategy for trying to get um, courts in particular to consider the supplement when addressing issues um, that are covered by the um, YP plus 10 supplement? So uh, can I ask what, what the advocates are doing to propel these human rights, the, the principles into courts and government decisions? Uh, can I, I can try and address this. Um, uh, with, with the original um, uh, principles have been in existence for 10 years, and it, it took a while for, for pickup, but they were picked up because uh, we discussed them, we disseminated them, we did training with the judiciary, we did training with the peace, we did training with the lawyers. So, it is our responsibility, advocates of human rights, um, our responsibility as jurists, our responsibility as academics, to ensure that uh, we, uh, we, we use them, we discuss them widely as possible. Uh, as we are doing these webinars, and the, the purpose is basically to get buy-in into this. And what we have seen uh, with the evidence that we've got, if you go to the ARC International um, uh, uh, website, you might find some, some information with evidence to this. You see there's been decisions that have picked up these, these obligations and, and uh, these, these uh, principles and basically used them to, to elaborate on exist, uh, rights that are existing in their, in their constitutions. Um, you know, uh, the, the, the decisions are, are extremely important because then that means as soon as they uh, they articulated in that way. They become part of a very serious source of law in the country. And so I believe it is our responsibility to disseminate, uh, to share with our, uh, our state parties to, to ensure that they understand. And also because they are not binding, I believe that sometimes states are more willing to have a conversation around this because of, uh, they feel they are a little bit more flexible. So we have that kind of obligation to disseminate and show that they are. Another very effective way to raise, uh, to do that is uh, that in connection to cases, so when it comes to the judi judiciary, there are, there are always a, 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 an opportunity for amicus brief expert opinions. So how to train those and submit amicus briefs that are citing the, the Jogjakarta and the Jogjakarta Plus 10 principles. So make these principles alive on a daily practice. And um, uh, thus far, almost every high court decision from um, any country dealing with LGBTI issues has referenced the Yogi Carta principles. The exceptions include the United States, which did not, and um, maybe two other countries, but the vast majority of courts will always reference the principles. All right, so thank you, everybody. Um, I want to thank all three of our panelists, uh, Monica, Mauro, and Esther. Uh, and if you have any questions, feel free to contact uh, us here at the Williams Institute or any of the panelists directly. And uh, that's it. Thanks very much, folks. Thank you, thank you. Andrew. And good night. Bye-bye.